go. Today we're going to be covering chapter 8 and the chapter 8 is going to get into the fuel injection part of the system. So we've covered all the slow pressure stuff, how we get fuel to the system, now we're going to get into actual the fuel system. And this particular chapter at first I thought was going to be covering uh, governors and how governors work and we are, but we're only going to cover the electronic side of it. So this chapter really is just the electronic side of fuel injection. And before we really get into it, this first chart just kind of covers the costs from the manufacturer standpoint. You can see the fuel system is a major expense in a diesel fuel system. And so there's a lot of money put into it, especially today with the new emission standards. The fuel system is a very expensive part of the engine. So even in the old system with mechanical fuel injection systems and mechanical fuel injectors, it still was very expensive. Rebuilding a pump is going to easily cost you $1,000. To buy a new pump is going to cost you way more than $1,000. Today we're replacing that with computers which cost more than $1,000. So we're just substituting software for hardware. So fuel system, if you have a turbocharger, they're very rather expensive. And so the other stuff it all takes up smaller parts. And this is things that haven't changed a lot. They've changed, but not tremendously. There are three, four different kinds of fuel injection systems that are out there. Three of these that we typically might find in turf equipment of some sort. The first one is a mechanical fuel injection pump with lines coming out. And so one unit is controlling and putting out however many cylinders is and you have a line that runs independently to each injector. Second one is going to be a high pressure common rail system. We have one pump just creating high pressure. This tube fills up with fuel, fuel and it has pressure in it. And then the injectors are going to be typically controlled by some kind of electronics. And so each, each injector is independently controlled electronically. The third one is a unit injector system. This one's going to run off the camshaft. This is a system that I'm not aware of anything in the turf world uses this system, even in the old style. And I'm not aware of this. And so they're using the camshaft to create pressure and then they're electronically activating the fuel injector. And I could be wrong too, but the more of the unit injector system, the one that you're unfamiliar with, I think that's more into those, the bigger this is common in a, a Cummins, big Cummins engine. That's where I would see them. I just haven't seen them and they may be in the world. I just, it's not something I've seen. This last one, which is a unit pump system, that is in our world. We have the example of this one if you want to zero in on it. This particular Onan engine here has individual pumping elements that are completely separate. There's an individual line that comes up to the injector that's up here on top. So they're individual systems running off of the camshaft. So that would be this last style. That is in a small diesel engine. But they throw this picture in, but really none of the rest of this chapter covers this types of system. Mainly the rest of this, the chapter is covering the electronic side of it. So we're really going to focus on the electronic side. We're going to talk about the reasons for the high pressure. There's three main reasons why we have a high pressure ignition system or injection system. First thing is it takes a lot of pressure to penetrate the compression that's in a diesel engine. We start getting up there between 600 and 1200 psi of pressure. That injector has to be able to overcome that and actually blow fuel through that system. So it's a very dense mass of air that's in there and we have to be able to penetrate that with the injector. So it takes a lot of pressure just to overcome that. Second thing is it has to be atomized and the smaller it is the better it is and all the new systems the pressures have just keep going up and up and up because the more pressure we have, the finer we can atomize it. The finer we atomize it, the better we can control emissions that we're dealing with. And the third thing, reason why, is you don't have a lot of time. It is a very short period of time that we have to mix this fuel into the combustion chamber. It has to absorb heat that's in the area in the combustion chamber, converts it into a greater vapor, so has to vaporize it, and it has to begin burning and actually complete the burning process all 
in a very short, short window of degrees. And so it's important that this system is high pressure enough to get it out of ice, get it closer to a vapor, so that it can actually take place in that time frame. <clears throat> so there are three big reasons. All diesel engines have some sort of governor system. The governor is not just your foot pushing on it. Even if you have a foot throttle that's controlling it, you still need to have some sort of governor. The old systems were mechanical. They had flyweights, they had a spring, so it's all mechanical. This chapter is not really covering that, so it'll be picked up later when we get into mechanical systems. This chapter is focused mainly on the electronic side of it. And so the speed is going to be controlled on all diesel engines by the volume of fuel. RPM is controlled by volume of fuel. The governor's job is to maintain or monitor that speed and determine whether it needs to give more fuel or less fuel. So from an idle to full throttle, there's a governor that's monitoring and keeping it in check. We don't want diesels to go too fast. They tend to do bad things when they go too fast and they typically don't go too fast because you just run out of air. And we run out of time to actually make it burn. So we, we pass our smoke limit and it just doesn't run very well. So the governor's job is to maintain the speed that we want through those, that whole range. It monitors the speed, adjusts for varying load conditions. As you put a load on, it tries to maintain constant RPM. And it can be done either electronically or mechanically. And in this case, this chapter, we're going to be covering the electronic side of it. So we have lots of functions, lots of things this injection system has to do. It has to meter the right fuel, so the quantity determines everything. So it has to be the right quantity. It has to happen at the right time. So if we put it in too late, we put it in too soon, it doesn't give us good performance. So we want to do it at the right time. The fuel combustion timing, fuel combustion of a diesel engine it's burning is all controlled by the timing of the diesel injection system. It's not done by, an in, by a spark plug, it's done by the injection of the fuel. It also has to control the rate of the fuel. And it used to be we would just put one rate, whatever volume we wanted, we shot it in there. And now we do multiple injections and all kinds of stuff we'll be talking about here. And so it has to control all that. It has to atomize the fuel. If it sprays in as a stream and not as an atomized mixture, then it's not going to burn well. We're going to have emissions problem and that's going to cause issues with it. So it has to be atomized to the appropriate amount of atomization. And then it has to distribute the fuel throughout the whole combustion chamber. If it sprays it all to one side or just puts it in a small area, it's not going to burn very well and so it has to distribute it evenly and perfectly throughout the whole cylinder each time in order for us to meet our emissions requirements. <laughs> Compensation. Governors either are going to add fuel or reduce fuel. They don't actually close a throttle plate, they don't reduce air. The governor compensates for speed changes by adding or subtracting fuel. So it's attached directly to the fuel arm of the mechanical system or electronically, it's going to stop or add more fuel electronically. So it's controlling fuel directly. Idle adaptation, slight adjustment to quantity of fuel in each cylinder to improve smooth operation and lower emissions. And so with the new computer control systems, because we have computers, we're monitoring everything, we can actually monitor how an engine runs and the governor can actually add or subtract fuel to different cylinders to make it run smoother. So it can actually adapt to the environment that it's in and actually add or subtract so it runs as smooth as possible. It definitely reduces noise by doing that. So we're going to be adding multiple injections to get rid of noise. So for emissions, a slight variation in injection quality between cylinders or from shot to shot. So if the injector, injector itself doesn't have consistent atomization, consistent injection shots, if there's a slight variation, it's going to affect our emissions. And so it's very important that our injector is actually a consistent 
and that each cylinder runs the same amount, or not the same amount, but the right amount each time. So that's going to be paramount in order to get our emissions to actually be correct. We didn't really care about it before, smoked a little bit, smoked a lot, we didn't care. Today, we can't smoke. So this screenshot is showing you that this particular engine has different volumes at different cylinders. Each cylinder is controlled independently with an electronic system versus mechanical. In mechanical, these would all be in a straight line. So unless the person that actually set the, the fuel injection to pump up made some kind of incorrect adjustment, they're basically designed to be the same fuel at the same rate all the time. In electronic, because it's all electronic and we can monitor and vary things, we can actually add or subtract fuel volume to make the engine run as perfect as possible. So it's constantly adapting, it's constantly learning, it's constantly monitoring and adapting to make it right. So even though it's not the same, it's making the engine run as perfect as possible. These might be you know, a, a valve that's leaking a little bit, so my compression is a little bit lower in this cylinder, so it may need to adjust the fuel volume to deal with a leaky valve. It could be a little bit more worn rings. It could be a score in the pistons cylinder or something like that that would make that cylinder run a little bit off. And so it'll adjust to make it compensate for that. Here's another screenshot. Just kind of shows you that its ability to actually add or subtract fuel to make it run. And so computers kind of really change the world on how engines run and then make them run really smooth. So basically with the cylinder three there, with that being high, all the other cylinders is kind of is it minus them to compensate for the high volume for the cylinder three? It could be doing that. And it may be that there's something wrong with volume in three. This one here has a high number in three, which is an exceptionally high number in three. So it may be that that cylinder has poor compression. And so the engine is monitoring and saying, hey, we're having a dip in RPM when number three fires. Let's add more fuel and see if we can bring the speed up. And if the compression is low, then its ability to actually perform is gonna be low. So it can't solve all problems. Sometimes it'll actually pick up and it'll start trying to add fuel to smooth it out, but maybe there's a problem in that cylinder. If it has a bad valve, and that valve is leaking, the intake valve is sticky, it's got a piece of debris in it, and it's not sealing, the computer may try to overfuel that cylinder trying to actually get that cylinder back up to speed, but because compression is low, it's off. So this may be a sign that we have a problem, not necessarily, because it shouldn't be that far off. That's pretty excessive. It should still be like negative numbers. Should be, yes. And these negatives may be because this one here is so high, these have to go kind of negative to offset whatever's going on there. So this may be a troubleshooting, say this doesn't look right, something is way out of whack here. Let's go look at that cylinder, do a compression test, do something. So we have lots of ways of doing that. In order to adapt, we have to sense a lot of stuff. So we have a cam sensor. We're gonna measure the camshaft, how fast it's turning, what position it's in. We're gonna have a crank sensor. And in the, in the flywheel, they have a reluctor. And a reluctor is either a piece of metal that actually passes by the coil of wires and either creates a magnetic a uh, pulse in there, a little pulse of electricity, or there'll be a gap. Sometimes there's a gap, sometimes there's a piece of metal, sometimes there's a magnet. So there's various ways we can actually do that. And so this reluctor is an object that's there that when it passes by my crank sensor, induces a voltage, puts a pulse, the computer reads those pulses and it understands what speed is it at. So it monitors speed of the crank and of the camshaft. And then it puts a symbol, sing, signal out here the computer's going to read it, determines when it's going to fire. So it's just two of the inputs that are there. Calibration codes, if you were to replace an injector, for some reason these newer systems, if you buy a new injector, you don't just put the new injectors in, you don't randomly put them in. There's going to be some sort of calibration code that's actually printed on the injector. And you'll need to go into the computer and actually put that code in the computer so the computer knows 
how that car or that, that how that injector is calibrated that way it can actually adjust and actually control its fuel volume if you don't do that you have the wrong calibration code in there your engine is going to run rough because it thinks it's one injector and it's actually another so it's going to be important that you actually type in that code so if it's off you'll get hunting we call sometimes we'll call that surging but that's when your engine's not running smooth and it may be because you changed an injector and you didn't actually calibrate it correctly which means putting in the right codes so storing them you want to make sure that you keep those calibration codes in the computer make sure you store it and then the computer itself will actually take that code converts it into an algorithm and determines how to inject the engine so it's going to be important that you don't just drop them. read the manual figure out what it says and there'll be a number that you have to type in so once we start injecting, here's my average fuel injection delivery value. But with electronic injection, instead of being a linear value like you might find with a mechanical system, it's going to be constantly adjusting itself, trying to make the engine as smooth as possible. This is the average, but the actual injection delivery value is going to be varying to try to make it smooth. So the, you remember that Circling Raven. Circling yes. Raven, where he was able to just plug straight into the thing. That would tell him all that and mm -hmm. how to adjust it. So those screens that we've seen where it showed cylinder thing, that computer at Circling Raven that the Toro guy demonstrated for us, you could actually go in and read exactly what he's seen. And couldn't you also adjust it from the computer? Well? You, that's where you would go in and put that code in. So you would go in there and actually look at the number. You'd type that number into the machine, into the computer, and calibrate the, the car, or the computer. How many things going on? Wasn't he able to shut down each mm -hmm. cylinder? So we're going to talk about the fact that he can shut it down and why that's important. So we'll talk about that briefly. So these calibration codes, you got to put them in, and once you put them in, then the computer is going to take that information. And it's not a perfect injection pattern because the computer is going to be learning itself. It's a constantly trying to adapt to its environment, and it's going to move it around until this engine runs as smooth as possible. So here is an injector. It's got a date code like when it was built, calibration code, that's what you're typing in. It's a pretty long number. Where was this plant or this injector built? This is the injector number. So all this information is on the top of the injector. And you need to make sure that you type in this calibration code into the, the computer. The calibration code right there, that laser etched one. Mm -hmm. This one right here? On the other one. Over here. That's the serial number, laser, oh here it is. Can't you just scan that? Uh, you could probably scan it if you had one of those scanners. Yeah, if you had the ability to scan, you could scan it, and then you don't have to misprint typing on all those letters in. Because that's a, it's a lot of numbers and stuff. And sometimes so, it could be worn or you might be able to Well, and if these are worn, you're going to lose it too. So here they have, you know, you can scan it, or you can try to type it in so from over here. So they have two. So, and I think we actually seen that on the one at the, the Toro one that we looked at. I think we can actually see these numbers. You think he showed them to us? But that's the only place I've seen that. I haven't got to see any other ones out there. Probably what they should do on something like that, just in case you get a new one that have like the, either the barcode or the numbers not legible, that they should have it written down on a paper so you don't have to. I don't know, I mean, unless you wrote them down on a paper. But as you can see here how long that code is. It's a pretty long code. And so typing it in can be a tedious job and it's going to be important to do. So this is on Duramax, but we've seen it on a Toro Fairway mower. So it's, it's in our industry in a turf mower. So calibration benches. So if you were to take this to a diesel repair shop, in the old days with mechanical injectors, we had these calibration things. We put the pump in there, put our injectors in here, and we would actually measure the fuel volume mechanically. Now it's going to be electronic, it's different. This is all mostly mechanical. Now 
the electronic ones, you need to send them to the OEM, and the OEM's going to do it. So the, that machine right there will probably be basically obsolete now. <laughs> It's becoming, it will, it will become a little more obsolete, but we still need it because you remember, this technology has been around for 40, 50 years, whereas the electronics only been around for two or three years, or five years. Some of it's been around a little bit longer than that, but as far as even in our industry, it just came to our industry. So this system, still necessary for the old, but you won't need it in the future because you can't do it in the future. The manufacturer has taken your ability to, to repair. You cannot take a unit injector and rebuild. I can't go to Welland Diesel here in Walla Walla and actually rebuild one because the code that it takes to do all the calibration, they won't give it to you. So OEMs have said, no, it's proprietary. We're going to retain it. You have to mail it in. They have a specific in-house person that does that. So, so this is test equipment that you don't, you can't afford to buy this, you can't do your own calibration, it's just not even remotely feasible. So you have to be a licensed Well you need to have a shop that could afford to buy this thousands of dollar machine and you'd have to do enough business to pay for it and there's no way that you're going to do that in house. So that's why there are specialty fuel injection shops and those people rebuild pumps and they can rebuild injectors and they can actually calibrate them and make sure everything's working right. So you don't do that. You just send it in. So there's a lot of things. We got our electronic control unit, our ECU, and there's a lot of inputs and we have some outputs. And so we're going to measure a lot of different parameters. The computer's going to put them into a mathematical formula and calculate when and how much fuel to deliver. So we're going to have throttle positions, so we drive by wire, we're running, our foot throttle is running a variable resistor, it's a drive by wire. We have a turbo boost pressure that we'll be monitoring that affects what our fuel quantity is going to be. We have our air inlet temperature, so how warm it is outside that affects our quality and delivery. Oil temperature, we want to know if our engine's overheating, so we want to know what the oil temperature and what our coolant temperature is so that we can adjust for that. We want to know what our oil pressure is. In some cases, the oil pressure, they use oil to actually run the high pressure injection system. And so oil pressure, until it gets to a certain point, it can't inject, we don't even turn the fuel on. So some of them oil pressure is critical. Fuel temperature, because we know that dumping cold fuel into the system is going to affect it. So the air temperature and the coolant temperature, or the fuel temperature, are going to be pretty critical. So we also want to know what our crank engine crank is turning at, and we want to know what our cam is turning at. So they're going to look at those two pieces of information, and they're going to send a pulse out there to the injector and tell it when to fire. They're going to be looking for feedback back from the injectors, because a lot of these electronic injectors are also measuring <coughs> vibration and stuff and feeding that information back to the computer and saying, hey, that's created a, a vibration. Let's reduce the fuel, let's add fuel to try to smooth it out. So a lot of knocking and, and just vibrations are monitored now by the injector. So they, do they have, and I don't remember if they do, but the knock sensors like the cockpit, like gasoline engine or is that the... It's going to be a similar thought process, whether it's monitoring exactly the same, I don't know that answer. These are actually part of the injector itself. So my brother's Fent tractor, the number one injector was $1,500 because that injector was measuring the knocking on the engine, how smooth it was running, and that injector broke. And when it broke, $1,500. And they shipped it back to, to Fent and Fent sent them a replacement. So you just trade it out, but you trade it out plus $1,500. <laughs> And so that particular one was very expensive because it actually was the one that gave feedback to it. So it just had one feedback injector. So we have a diagnostic connection. That's what I hook my computer to, to read it, adjust it, do whatever I'm doing. We have digital outputs, which may be something on my dashboard. Analog outputs might be also on my dashboard. Lamps that tell me things are good and bad and then some sort of power to power it up. A lot of stuff coming and going from the computer 
We're reading a lot of things to try to make it work correctly. We also have our after treatment systems, ABS or other modules are all feeding into the same system and our ECM, our engine control module is calculating all this information. So it's just a lot of pieces to the puzzle. It's not simple like it used to be. Remanufacturing injectors is, just doesn't happen today. It's proprietary toward the OEM and you have to mail them back and they send you a new one. So, or, or a rebuilt one. But you won't, even the fuel injection shops won't be able to do it. So unless they're licensed by that manufacturer, they won't be able to do it. So there may be fuel injection service places that become licensed and they have to you know, not share that information and they wouldn't want to because if they knew that, they're the only ones that have that information. Where do you send your stuff to? Them. So they're not going to just freely give that out because then they're out of their job. So I don't know if that'll become true or not, whether they will do that or if it's just going to stick in-house. And in-house may be uh, the local shop that they've tied up with or something. So your onboard diagnostic system is what OBD stands for. Everything is going to be monitored, logged. There's, you'll be able to go in and see what's happened in the last period of time since you erased it. And you can kind of look for problems, codes, that kind of stuff. So we're going to use our OBD reader or our computer to go in and actually monitor all this stuff. So it's going to be logged and it's going to be trying to maintain perfect emission standards. Cylinder misfires. This is where I kind of want to talk about what happened at the mechanics seminar that some of us were at up in Coeur d'Alene. They had a Toro mower there. It had, a, did it have a Kubota engine in it? It was a Yanmar. Yanmar, that's right. It was a Yanmar. So it had a Yanmar engine in it, and the gentleman hooked up a computer, which was had screens like we seen here earlier. We were able to put the codes and stuff in for it. And then he actually was able to he was able to go through a diagnostic code and actually troubleshoot from his laptop. And from his laptop he could sit there in a chair and he could turn cylinders off, he could turn them on and do a lot of diagnostic stuff that's in there. So he was able to do that from his computer. You don't want to say, well, I don't have the computer. I'm going to diagnose it by unplugging. If you start unplugging injectors to see if it'll, you know, cut it out or not, it'll actually throw a code and the computer goes into default. So you can't plug and unplug anything on the system for troubleshooting. If you do, it throws codes and it screws everything up and you gotta shut it all down and reset it and start all over. So the only way to diagnose a defective cylinder is to use and have the correct software. So you, you gotta be able to go in the computer, electronically shut it off and turn it on. You can check voltages, you can check pulse width modulation, you can check all kinds of stuff, but you've got to have the computer system. So don't try to, to bypass it. So you can unplug, if you, you cannot unplug it, you have test equipment, you can switch them off if you have the test equipment. You can actually move the injector, so if you have an engine that's misfiring, you want to know if it's the engine or the injector, you can pull two injectors and you can swap them, but when you do that, you have to also change the codes. So you have to go through and change the codes, and then if the problem goes to a different cylinder, you know it's the injector. If it doesn't change cylinders, you know it's the engine related, something mechanical. So that is possible. So why did Toro, why did they start putting Yanmar's in Toro when Yanmar was exclusively to John Deere? Yanmar is not exclusive oh. to John Deere. They do have a division of Yanmar that is exclusive to John Deere and that exclusive part of it, that engine, whatever John Deere wants on their particular engine, cannot be sold. So there is Yanmar kind of standard and there's Yanmar specific to John Deere. So they went with John Deere and the Toro product because the Yanmar had multiple places where they could put the after treatment system on. So the positioning of that filter system that um, after treatment system because it could go in multiple locations on a Yanmar and the flexibility of that, that's why Toro went with that. So 
So this one here is looking at injection timing. In a mechanical system, we have a governor that can change timing a little bit, but timing is a lot more difficult and very static, and it just kind of is speed related that's gonna change it. With electronic, we can change it due to temperature, we can change it due to load, we can change it to um, uh, just RPMs. There's a lot of things that we can change, and the timing of when the injection process takes place is going to change and vary a lot. So it can be anywhere from five degrees before top dead center at a low RPM. As the RPMs go up to 1400, we may move it back to 20 degrees. And at 21, nearly full, full speed, it might be 45 degrees before top dead center. So these numbers down here, it says 45 degrees, 30, 15. What that is, is 10 degrees afterwards plus 20 gives me 30. So this one we have 10 degrees plus 5 gives me this 15. And 45 is 10 plus 35. And what we want is we want maximum combustion pressure at 10 degrees after top dead center. We want that flame front to be as strong as possible to give us maximum pushing of that piston down on the cylinder. And so we're going to vary the injection point so that the 10 degrees doesn't move. That's true even in a gas engine. We're always changing spark timing to give us this 10 degrees. So you notice that's pretty fixed. If I'm under a load, under a loader, I probably want to do this timing different than I would have the mechanical system that just varied it according to what we just seen. So this one here, same RPM, full load, medium load, low load, even since the loads themselves have changed with varying loads, we would change when the point of injection is. So 5, 20, 35. RPM stays the same, but the injection time takes place different because we have a different load. If I have If I have a low load, I'm not going to inject very much fuel because there's not much load there, it doesn't take much to maintain it. So if I have very small amount of fuel, I'm going to inject sooner so that that small amount of fuel in a large area of, of air has more time to actually burn. When I pour a large amount of fuel into that same amount of air, because there's more concentration of fuel, it's gonna ignite sooner and actually begin burning the center sooner, I'm actually gonna inject it later. That's why this is later under a full load versus no load and, and sooner over there. This is just a map that the manufacturer creates and you'll, the importance of the map is to show that the timing of when stuff is injected changes all the time. The chart goes this way, this is the speed that the engine's traveling, so even as the engine travels, changes in speed, you can see that the map of when different injections take place, how much is injected, whether we do a pilot, then a, then a pre and a post and our main injection, all those things are all mapped out here. So we have a pre-injection, post in, um, like a post injection, then maybe a final injection. So there's various injections that take place and the map with a computer, there's all, there's no way that you could do all of this activity with a mechanical system. Both the invention of a computer and the precision of a computer, now we can map this out and we can make those injections absolutely coincide with where we want it, when we want it, make it quiet as possible, smooth as possible, least amount of emissions as possible, and we have lots of control over it. So, it's a lot of good things that have come with the emission standards. I mean, it's really pushed this technology, and part of the emission standards coming was because computers have advanced enough that we could actually do this. So it wasn't because we didn't want to. We didn't have computers capable before. Now we have computers can capable, now we can do it. And you can get more horsepower out of it as well. You're gonna, you're gonna be able to utilize every drop of that fuel and you'll be able to get as max amount of horsepower at the least amount of fuel. 
what you'll find is the computer because they're controlling everything and it gets the maximum amount any problems that take place in the engine instead of you noticing that you have a coming problem the computer will constantly vary everything and make your engine sound really good but you could have an engine that's like self-destructing or almost self-destructing and not even know until all of a sudden it shuts down so I know of big trucks that had a computer system on it where it was running rough, it'd run rough for a while and then it would kind of smooth out and then all of a sudden it would run rough and then smooth out and so they finally took it in the shop, it was done with whatever they're doing, took it in and they took the engine apart and one of the cylinders was just really bad shape but the computer every time it hit a rough patch the computer would monitor, adjust and actually fix it so all the symptoms got covered up even though it wasn't pretty, it was nasty. So it's nice, but sometimes it actually covers up problems. So injection timing, the burning, burning more fuel causes combustion temperatures and pressures to rise proportional to the fuel burned. As we put more fuel in, there's more energy release, there's more pressure, and our temperatures are going to rise with it. When we put a little bit of fuel into a lot of air, there's going to be very little heat generated. So the best engine efficiency is, is achieved at peak cylinder pressure and is produced just after top dead center. So that's when everything reaches this maximum point. That's when we're going to get the best efficiency. And then we're going to adjust all of our other timing to make that take place. Injection timing is retarded which means it gets closer to top dead center when cranking. And it seems kind of odd, because you would think if I'm cranking them at low speeds, that I would want to start that fuel fire sooner so that we can take off. But at low engine RPMs, if we start the fire too soon, piston is traveling up, we start the fire way back here at 30 degrees before top dead center, the flame expands, and the piston is going to be pushed back down or the piston might not go all the way back down, but the engine is, starter is now trying to compress this expanding fuel mixture. And so it puts a lot more strain on the starter and it puts a lot more pressure in the system. So by retarding, which means closer to top dead center, by retarding the timing when you're cranking, it's easier for the crank, the starter to turn over and because when I put fuel into that cavity, the fuel is going to be colder than the cylinder temperature. When I throw the fuel in there, it has to absorb that heat in order to vaporize and burn. So when I throw that fuel in there, I'm actually sucking the heat out of the cylinder. So by putting it, retarding it, putting it closer to the top dead center, we're going to build up more heat, put more heat in there, so it actually will be hotter when they actually throw the fuel in. So it seems counterproductive to do what they do, but that's what we can do with a computer. As soon as it starts, so it fires off and it fires, RPM is going to jump up a little bit. After it starts, we're going to advance it, so we're trying to advance that timing, to compensate for the delay. So anytime I'm running at a low RPM with low amounts of fuel, I need to do it sooner because I have a large volume of air and I have a small amount of fuel. It just takes time to get that flame going, burning, and expanding. And so we're going to advance the timing. So instead of being close to the top dead center, we're going to advance the timing. And that's back on those earlier slides where we're back at 30 degrees before top dead center. It's going to go retard, fire, advance right away, just instantly. And with a computer, it's just right back there to advance. So it's going to compensate for this delay period to try to minimize smoke and have as little emissions as possible. So we're going to be playing with this information with the computer and with the electronics. It's easy to do. I added this. this. is not in your book. But what you'll find is if you are cranking an engine, if you bump your starter over and the piston comes up on compression stroke and then you stop it, what's going to happen? You're going to build up heat. And it's going to be absorbed by engine block. If you piston goes up, hits that top dead center, almost top dead center, and you stop it there, all the heat that you generated is going to go where? 
right into the piston, right into the cylinder. So if you do quick crank bursts, and it goes and goes and goes, goes and goes, what's going to happen is every time you stop, the heat that you generated at that point is going to go into that block, and the block will heat up around those areas faster than if you just keep cranking. So you are just crank, 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 and the piston goes down, and part of that heat goes right out the exhaust pipe. So by doing short bursts rather than just keep cranking, 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 you'll actually put a little heat into the combustion chamber and you'll get faster starts than if you just keep cranking. So it's just one of those techniques or things that you can do even with the older mechanical systems especially really. In those systems if you do short cranking, crank, 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 crank. Just do short ones and just pause. And be patient. You'll find it'll actually start faster than if you just hold the starter and try to burn up your starter. It's also going to be easier on your starter because every time you let up on the starter, the starter is going to cool off. So it's going to heat up extremely fast and it cools off fairly fast. So pausing is actually easier on your starter. So this is just a troubleshooting thing. Compression temperatures. When it's cold out, you're drawing cold air in, your compression temperature is going to be lower. So it naturally should occur to you that if you are sucking cold air in and I try to compress it, my final temperature is going to be lower than if I sucked in hot air. Hence, that's why we have intake heaters so that we can heat up the air going in so that when we compress it, the final result is going to be higher. So here, if we are cold air coming in, our peak temperature when we're cranking is going to be lower than if it was warmer air. So this thing would be kind of the same thing. By turning on an intake heater, you would raise it. I'm going to raise my combustion temperature and it's going to start easier. So cold ambient temperatures produce colder pre-ignition compression. Temperatures, a drop in temperature prior to top dead center is caused by cold engine parts absorbing the compression heat near top dead center. So this is what I was talking about where as that piston travels up, the piston absorbs heat, the cylinder, the cooling system around it, the valves themselves, the head of the valves, all that stuff is going to absorb heat. So cold temperatures, all that heat's got to go somewhere. It's going to go into the metal components. So we're going to want to do short bursts and we're going to do better. Would you recommend doing that short burst for like your vehicle? Your car? Yeah. It would work in a car too, the same idea. In a car, because we have sparks, even if the fuel's bad or cold, the spark is still gonna ignite it. So it's not as predominant, you're not gonna see the results in a car like you would in a diesel. In a diesel, because I'm using heated compression, that's why it makes such a difference. And it seems like you'd only do this more in like well, you wouldn't need to do it in the summertime. So does the, so does the operating temperature of a diesel run hotter than a gas engine? No. It doesn't? No. So if you had a direct inject diesel engine in the summertime with the glow plugs that were bad or something like that, you could use something, you would try and start it the same way you would with a cold diesel. You could do something like that. Oh. Could. Um, like our forward power stroke out here, when the injectors go bad, not the injector, when the glow plug module goes bad, if you actually do short bursts, you can actually get it to start. But if you just go out there and crank it, it actually wets down the cylinder, and then it just, that's when it smokes, and you see that big cloud of smoke coming out. What you've done is injected some fuel in there, and it's wetted the cylinder down, and a wet cylinder is absorbing that heat, and then it doesn't want to burn. If you did short bursts, it would actually get something to a temperature that could fire, and you would actually fire before it makes it so wet. So that's why it does work on that Ford. Back to your statement as far as uh, diesels run cooler because the flame that's there is not such a violent flame, and because my compression is so much tighter instead of all that heat that we built up going right into the cooling system and a gas engine got this big cavity 
that's all exposed to the cooling system. In the diesel, you have very little space exposed to cooling. So we're gonna put more of that heat into moving the piston and actually usable energy. In a gas engine, we it's lost in the cooling system and it goes out the exhaust pipe. So it's more efficient and they tend to be cooler. Why do they not use a gas engine in a wheat stubble field? Because the exhaust pipe gets really hot and the engine runs really hot. Whereas a diesel engine will run cooler and you don't start the fire. The muffler doesn't start the fire because the muffler is not so hot. That used to be true until the new emissions, And the new emissions is still true until suddenly you throw a bunch of fuel into that afterburner fuel thing and, and that becomes a problem. So. You don't have a backfire in a diesel engine, no. So, what does backfire come from? Uh, and, uh, gas or diesel? and a gas. Uh, a, backfire would be like fuel entering into the spark. So it's fuel that enters into the muffler because the muffler exhaust is so hot that when that fuel hits that muffler and it's already hot, then it auto ignites. We don't need a spark because it's, the heat's in the muffler. So backfire is unburned fuel that gets into the muffler with a hot muffler, it ignites in the muffler and blows out. That's mostly where that backfire is coming from. That would be like an intake valve that's not seating and some of those gases are being pushed backwards and I have, when you have enough ability to push gases back up the intake, because it's not seating, and then my spark plug fires, what also happens? The flame follows that same leak and blows back up my intake manifold. I just <sighs> so most of the time, it's either timing, because the valves are doing, they're not closed all the way, but usually it's just a leaky intake valve that'll let you have a backfire. That's mostly the most common problem. So. So they're talking about this retarding still. When you retard the timing, the piston is closer to top dead center. There's a very, very small gap left in there when we actually throw the fuel in. So they're talking about in the earlier slide, it was at five degrees before top dead center. That is a very small amount of space. That heat is going to be captured in there. When I throw the fuel in, it's more likely to start. So you have the best chance of starting in cold weather when you do that at five degrees than you would if it was at 30 degrees. Because I'm gonna actually create more heat between 30 and five, and so that temperature is gonna keep building and building and building, and then I'm gonna throw it in there and get it to fire off. So. Then they give us a chart, talks about the change in injection timing. All of this changing in injection timing is all possible only because I have a computer. With a computer, now all things are possible. I can change the timing, I can break it up, I can give you multiple injection points, I can do lots of things. And all of these now, we can look at what's happening in my engine and what do I want to do or what can I do to eliminate some problem, whether it's particulate matter or oxides or cylinder pressure or exhaust temperature or noise. With a computer, I can change the parameters and vary them and eliminate these issues that we had. Old diesel engines, mechanical diesel engines, the guy drove up to you, you're like, oh, he's got a diesel. I mean, you knew, it rattled. The old Chevy, I mean, it's like so obnoxious. <laughs> even the Cummins, my brother drives up in his Cummins and it's like, shut it off. I can't even think, I mean, let alone talk to you. And so some of them are really loud. Well, we eliminated a lot of these simply by adjusting fuel delivery timing and volume and all that kind of stuff. It's just, I mean, I know that the new Chevy, whatever the new Chevy diesel is. And the Duramax. Man, my brother just drove up, I mean, he works for the Chevy deal. He's a car salesman for Chevy and he drove up with a brand new Duramax and you cannot hear it. I mean, it is as quiet as a car. He's like, 
Yeah, I'm sure it's a diesel because he always drives a diesel, but man, you can't tell it's a diesel when you drive up. It is so smooth. Really so, like I don't smell. I mean, there's no, all that odor is gone and the odor is coming from these oxides and nitrogen that are in there. So they, they've eliminated so many of these things. And those things we talked about yesterday, the aromatic or whatever, those big long chains, by reducing those, we're also getting rid of some of that odor. So there's a lot of things that we've done to get rid of the odor, get rid of the noise. The new EMR Taurus, they got rid of the small diesel and it smells like iron. Like what? It smells like what? Iron. Iron. Oh. So you started it up in the shop? I thought it was just the smell of money or something. I thought you were going to say. <laughs> so. No, it smelled like iron. They did something here in Zoss. Like well, it's whatever's in the after treatment system. So. So injection timing, injection timing completely affects how emissions take place. By advancing and retarding, we can lower particulate matter. So particulate matter and NOx are two opposite positions. Both of them are, you fix one, you create the other. And we want to be right here. We want our injection timing to create this scenario the best balance between the two, then you're going to find that my fuel consumption is also going to match with it. So with the computer system, we're able to follow it in this band and actually put it where it needs to be so that it works great. So older mechanical systems, they kind of pick the best of the two worlds. They picked a pretty good range in there and said, okay, this is injected fuel here. And they only get one shot, so they inject all the fuel at one time. So they picked this band and it used to be half a degree that they did. Now we're down to one one hundredth of a degree. So the precision of electronics compared to mechanical is just amazing. So it's kind of nice. Kind of crazy, it's expensive. Changes how you adjust things, changes how you work on them, but it's not really a major thing. It's, I mean, it's a different kind of troubleshooting. So, injection timing on emissions, combustion, so same kind of thing. This is a sensor, so I want you to understand that the injectors themselves sometimes will have something that monitors. So this particular one has a knock sensor. So this little piece of material here is actually sensing what kind of vibration is taking place, sending a signal to the computer. The computer is going to be doing some adjusting, trying to make the engine run as smooth as possible. We can also put an item on there like that and measure injection timing because a tool called the piezometer, which is clamped on there just like that, clamps on there and it measures the growth of the metal. So every time that's injected under high pressure, you think of metal as pretty solid. Well, every time that an injector and fires, the metal actually grows. And the piezometer is so fine, it actually can pick up those pulsations of the metal and tell you which RPM your engine is. So it's called a piezometer. So we can use this for multiple things and send, a, send uh, information to my computer and the computer can make adjustments. So rate control, because with electronics we can give you multiple injections, we can control the rate, we can control the time, we can do multiple times, multiple rates, we can do all kinds of stuff. So rate control is just our ability to adjust all that. So the shape, we say rate shape injection, is because we're going to be changing that rate. The goals of two different rate control strategies conflict, the new rate control strategies can be developed. And so in the old times where we just had one, they might conflict. One was giving us noxious oxides, one is giving us horsepower. Now we can actually blend the two and actually make it right. So this two strategies is strategies between the mechanical and the new electronic stuff. So pilot injection, this is the biggest advancement that took place. Now instead of one shot of fuel, 20 degrees, 30 degrees before top dead center, you throw all this fuel in there and you kind of step back and you're like, okay, burn. And so there's a huge volume of fuel all of a sudden over here and over here and over here, a flame starts, the flame starts to grow and then the flames collide 
and it knocks. That's the rattle, rattle, rattle that we had. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna shoot a pilot. We're gonna throw a little bit of fuel in there. And that little bit of fuel is gonna start to burn, but it's not violent enough to actually knock. It's just gonna burn. And then once you get a flame, then we're gonna throw some fuel into it. So if you can imagine a hot air balloon, hot air balloon, the guy standing there, and when he pulls on that lever, what do you see? And he has a nice roaring sound. It's because there's a flame and then he adds fuel to it. If he didn't, if he just let gas out there and then boom, lit the gas, it'd go boom and it'd blow his hot air balloon apart. And so you can hear how that's nice and just and it's just this nice smooth sound. That's what we're doing with this pilot injection is we have this small flame that we created and then we're going to pour fuel into it and now we're just going to propagate that flame rather than putting a bunch of stuff out there and then do an uncontrolled burn whichever direction it's going to go in. And that's what's happening is we put gas that's just gas, diesel that's just gas, we put it in there and it's kind of traveling around and then we ignite it and then it's like lightning. It's like, oh, which way is it going to go? You know, and the flame is just traveling all over and we have no way of controlling it. Now we have control. So we're going to minimize the NOx because now instead of getting this violent explosion, these flame fronts all crash into each other and we get this gigantic um, compression pressures because NOx comes from that high temperature that suddenly we got this big flame that flared up. So we reduce the NOx. We're going to reduce the noise because we don't have a silent multiple clashing of flame fronts. And then our delicious, our delicious, our ignition delay, I was trying to add some words together and make a new word. So our ignition delay is eliminated because we don't have to wait. We can actually create a flame and then at the perfect moment that we want, we can actually put the fire in there, the fuel in there and actually create what we want. So we have a nice flame that we're just going to fuel at the right moment. So this ignition delay goes away. So much, much nicer. And here's kind of a idea of what the computer itself is doing. So we have a pilot injection and they kind of played with this concept and they got better at it. We went from one pilot injection and one main injection to two pilot injections and a main injection. And then they're like, hey, if we can do that, what about post injections? And so they went to pilots and we have main injections and the you can see that this one's ramped. There's all kinds of shapes that we'll see shortly. And then we have these post injections back here. Pistons traveling down. We're past that 10 degrees, that perfect place. And we can add a little bit more and actually do some stuff with our after treatment system. So there's a lot of things that we can do with the electronic stuff. And the nice thing for us, we let the automotive world and we let the big truck world figure it out. We took the best stuff that they had, shrank it down, and we're putting it in ours. So mostly what you're going to be dealing with is basic trouble-free stuff. The only reason you're going to be dealing with it is because somebody put the wrong oil in, put the wrong coolant in, left the radiator plugged, put bad fuel in it, or tried to bypass something, didn't put the right def, he tried to buy cheap urea. I mean, somebody did a bad maintenance practice and now you gotta fix their screw up. That's really what you're gonna be doing. So the system itself is pretty bulletproof. So conventional injection rate with an injector, we would boom, shoot the fuel in there, started here, ended here, you got what you got. And they could change the, the volume, the quantity would change, and but it was like, it started and it stopped and that was it. With electronics, we can vary the voltage and we can make this start out slow, we can ramp it up, we can go slow, we can drag it out. They can vary that fuel volume and then boom, shut it off exactly where they want. There's like a lot of precision with the electronic control. Here's a fuel economy. I can make something nice and lean. I can keep the NOx low by 
creating this nice smooth flame front that goes out there or I can give you power by just pouring the coal to it and actually give you some fuel, give you some energy. The computer can do all of these depending on what you do with your foot and what you tell it you want it to do. And we can reprogram, that's why you buy a computer program, we can reprogram the computer and say I want 60 more horsepower, I want 100 more horsepower, I want to have power, I want to have fuel economy, I want to have, what do you want? We can actually re-chip it, we can reprogram, we can do some things with it. And it's all over the board. There's lots of variations and lots of flexibility in what you do. So all of these things the computer's trying to play with and trying to get rid of or try to minimize or maximize something. So. With electronics, we're able to pull that uh, pencil open. We're going to open it electronically and we can vary our spray. Depends on what your needs are and what the computer's going to tell us. So we're going to shape that fuel injection by changing it. Mechanically, it would just, it always traveled the same distance and it was a little more difficult to do. In a mechanical fuel injector, fuel is actually pushed, it pushes against this slope right here and that slope is going to push it up. So if I put a lot of fuel in there, it would push it up more and inject it. If we wanted just a little bit of fuel, it's only going to lift up until the fuel pressure drops and then the spring is going to push it back down. So we're depending, our, our fuel rate is all dependent on how much that fuel is lifting up on that pintle. So the further we push it up, the more fuel is going to go out the tip down there. But it's still, you're, you're just trying to mechanically move an object up and create this spray pattern down here. Yeah, you can see that with our injector tester, if you pull <coughs> down fast enough, the flow is high enough going to the injector, it'll hold the pencil up the whole time. And we're going to look at that, so we'll have a presentation on that shortly. Pilot injection, it's just an effective strategy to minimize NOx, noise elimination, and optimize performance. That's what pilot's doing. Post-combustion injections, this is going to be dealing with particulate matter. So it's actually giving some supplemental heating to burn away the trapped soot. So it's kind of working with our after-treatment system. And so we're going to be playing with these posts. That means after the main injection to deal with this. So there, this is more of a modern uh, playing around here. So pilot injection event is part of a way the injection rate is control. Main injection is three degrees after top center ADTC. Uh, pilot injection 5.3 degrees. I don't know what AD. Forgot what ATC is, but anyway, you have a computer. These new computer things will tell you all of this information. You can go in, figure out when the pilot injection took place, how much fuel is being delivered what the delay is going to be, when does the main injection take place. So all this information shows up on the computer screen. You type in or tap in and there it is. And you can read it. And this is like a crank angle. So we got pilot injections, main injection, after treatment, regeneration. So atomization, atomization is critical with diesels today got to be in a vapor form. Vapor is just small fuel droplets. So we need to get smaller and smaller and smaller. The smaller it is, the better it's going to burn. The more we'll be able to put it into usable energy. So the breaking of fluid into smaller particles prepares that air fuel mixture for combustion. Um, this piece here, obviously when we start dealing with stuff that's 18,000 PSI, 30,000 PSI. You're not going to be checking for leaks with your hand. So it's just like hydraulics. You would use cardboard. And for the most part, you're going to know because it's going to show up. When it starts to leak, it's got fuel all over the place. So 18,000 PSI is going to be spraying all over. Whatever you do, don't go finding it with your hand. Shut it off and use something else. It's going to cause damage to your body. What creates 
the black soot that's coming out, this particulate formation, large field droplets. So if you're still getting you know, black soot coming out, it's gonna be large droplets of fuel, poor mixing of the air-fuel mixture, so you're not mixing it very well, inadequate temperatures, or inadequate combustion time. Those are the four problems that you're gonna have. Electronic systems are actually monitoring those and start eliminating them by doing adjustments. Mechanical systems, it's pretty much fixed. It's hard to adjust. You have to try to come up with some way to adjust it. Contemporary diesel technology, that's like the old stuff, requires higher pressurization for improved emissions and performance. They picked that Der Derek Brandes uh, uh, for president. He's a guy that has experience in professional technical from uh, Tri-Cities. Oh, okay. So that's the one we was rooting for. Great. So common rail injection systems were uh, a cam. So a cam would be the one where the camshaft is actually pushing on the injector, opens up the injector. A cam pressure is up to 18,000 uh, PSI at 2,000 RPMs. And 9,000 at 1,000 RPM. So a cam operated fuel injection system, the RPM of the engine varies it. In a common rail system, because the common rail actually has electronic controls of what relieves the pressure, a common rail system is more consistent over a larger RPM range. As soon as you crank it over, the pressure jumps up. Electronically, we control that pressure. We can maintain a constant pressure over the full range. So common rail is actually a better system than all the other systems that we had out there. And that's why virtually everything is now common rail. And at that kind of pressure, having it a very, very consistent pressure, not jumping all over the place, is going to be a lot easier on components and fuel lines. And that type of it's thing. one less variable that we have to jump around and try to monitor. If we can maintain that pressure constant, everything else constant, and then we're just adjusting other items. It just makes it simpler. So virtually everything today is common rail. And it's going to be greater than 18,000. 30, 40,000 are common numbers. I mean, it's just high, high numbers. So this is a just a, com, uh, a cam operated one where the camshaft actually is pushing it down. It's pushing the system down, and that's actually sometimes it's pressurizing the fuel. Sometimes it's just actually controlling when it's injected. So a lot of times we'll have electronic control of it, but the pressure is built up with the camshaft. Those. I haven't seen that system even used in the turf equipment world and even if it was it's now gone because now it's common rail. We lose pressure on everything when we lose it whereas electronic as it wears which the only thing that really you can have nozzle tip wear when it does that, the computer is monitoring that, and if it causes a knock or a shake or whatever because of it, it's going to adjust. All of these other systems, when they start to wear, they start to wear. We can't, it can't, it, it can't know, and it can't adjust for it. So that's why these systems are gone. They're, they're obsolete. I mean, you're, everything today is common rail and electronic control. You just, you have to. So, that doesn't mean you're not gonna work on it. And that's why we still cover it, is because, I mean, this new stuff just started. There's 40 years of old stuff out there that's still old and it's still tired and it's still working on. That's what you're working on in the shop right now. You're still dealing with it and you will be dealing with it for a long time. So you still got to know the old, but you also have to know the new, which just means you've more than doubled what you have to know to work on compact diesel engines. Because it was very, this class used to be very simple four years ago. It's still the same thing with cars too, you still have to know how to work on the old. Got on the old and the new. So it's just, this is just, it's complicated our life because it's a whole new world, whole new set of tools, whole new set of troubleshooting. But if you understand what it's trying to do, it shouldn't scare you. That's what I hoped you get out of this, is don't be scared of it. Embrace it. It's new technology. You're used to computers. That's why we're doing our classes this way. And so you get your computer, you plug it in, you open it up, play with it. It's no big deal. Although I have heard that a lot of the older mechanics uh, kind of, not 
equipment, they, a lot of the older mechanics don't like the newer stuff. Because they have to learn something new and they're looking at, I want to retire. I don't want to have to learn more stuff. I want to coast into retirement. And then when you started a mechanic 40 years ago, it's a pretty simple one. Obviously, if technology didn't change, you learn a bunch of stuff, you become good at it for a while, and you coast into retirement. Well, today, you don't coast in retirement because the technology is changing so fast. So they either stop working on the new stuff and let the young people work on it, or it just becomes what it is, and they just quit. So it's just a rapidly changing world where you can't stop learning, because in four years, this industry is revolutionized. In four years, the, the two-cycle word has changed dramatically. And so we're in a time frame where four years, if you left the industry and went to work for McDonald's, came back into it, you'd be in trouble. And if you're not constantly looking now, you'll be in trouble. So this is what Common Rail, Common Rail has a constant pressure versus stuff that's mechanically controlled. As the RPM goes up, pressures and stuff are changing, so Common Rail is just better. One thing I want you to know is on our old systems, like what you're working on in the shop, this clamp that's there, Make sure you put that clamp back because there's a lot of vibration taking place and it's like the clothes hanger effect. If those fuel injection lines are sitting there vibrating, they're going to get weak and eventually deteriorate. So if you took these off when you took your engine apart, make sure that they're tight and you put them back on. So that's what I want to point out in this particular slide. Those are important to kind of help reduce that vibration that's taking place. So put them back on, don't just check them over your left shoulder. This kind of just shows you the voltage that's being applied to the injector itself. Sometimes that voltage, you know, it's not perfectly smooth and it can change. I mean, we have these post injections, we have a slow piece here. So those voltages are varied to give us various injection rates and so there's just a lot of stuff that's taking place and that is chapter eight so i didn't have any props for chapter eight because it's all computer and we don't have any new systems to be able to look at and actually show you the new stuff and so those of you that went to the mechanics seminar got to see the new toro but at the computer that was a great window into where the industry is going and because it's still so new most of the manufacturers, when it first hit, didn't even know what they were going to do. Some of them, like John Deere, kind of wrote on their high emissions credits to kind of delay the system. And so Toro didn't have emissions credits. They had to jump in pretty quick. And so most manufacturers just barely got in under the wire and got something out there. And so as far as technicians, as far as us, trying to get information is challenging. When I went back to Kohler, I was at the GIE Expo, I went to a class on Kohler diesels, and when I was at the EETC conference, I went to the Kohler uh, diesel engine, and they didn't have any kind of computer readout that you could look at. So their system doesn't have a computer where you could go in and, and play with, whereas Yanmar, it was, like you see in the automotive world. So different manufacturers are choosing different paths. There's not gonna be one platform that you're gonna be able to go with. So you're gonna be learning. I'm still learning a lot about this because it is changing quickly. So, so that's chapter eight.